has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great king, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I could listen to that for a while right there. That's good. Great, great song. All right, take your Bible this morning, if you would. A little more volume on this mic, please. First Peter chapter 4, if you would, please. First Peter chapter 4 for our scripture reading this morning. <clears throat> First Peter 4. We're going to read verses 12 through the end of the chapter, verse 19. We'll read the verses responsibly, as we normally do. Begin together on 12, and I'll read 13. We'll alternate together till we end on verse 19. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 12 of First Peter chapter 4. Ready? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. <clears throat> but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is now come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And let's end reading 19 together also. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture uh, here this morning. I pray, God, that you would make each of our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word. Lord, I pray that each of us would ask you, <clears throat> ask the Holy Spirit to control us and help us to control our mind, not allow it to wander away and miss what you have for us today. Lord, bless the special now as it's sung. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Though he should slay me, I'll trust in him. His way is never wrong. In darkness I will praise his name. 
his glory shall be seen and he makes no mistakes god sees my ways and all my steps he hears my silent cry my heart is fixed i'll trust in him i need not ask him why my faith and hope are in the lord my refuge and high tower in quietness and confidence he is my strength each hour for he knows my fiery trial that I take. His glory shall be seen, and he makes no mistakes, no mistakes. Our God makes no Now, Father, as we bow in prayer, <clears throat> we come to the preaching of your word today. Lord, I want to thank you for the Bible, and Lord, I'm asking you now for special help this morning. Uh, I know this is the message that you have given to me to give to your people this morning. And Lord, I know how important a message this is, and Lord, I'm asking you to please help everyone to listen carefully. And that we'll all receive the help that you desire to give us as we look at this important, important subject this morning. So Holy Spirit of God, help me as I bring the truth and help each listener as they listen to the truth today. And I pray you would do your work in each one of our hearts as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> People all over the world are dying of starvation. Droughts leave people thirsty and have caused crops and different food supplies to fail. Hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes ravage the land. Some people live in the middle of war zones. Terrorism is on the rise. Millions of people suffer from different diseases. <clears throat> unemployment, health care, rising health care costs, rising cost of utilities and food become a problem for many. Suffering takes place all over the world. Suffering takes place even among Christians. No one is exempt from suffering. Christian suffering. Somewhere we got the idea <clears throat> that if I'm saved, I never should suffer. That as a Christian, if I suffer, I wonder what's wrong. Why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Is God mad at me? Is God punishing me? But you realize Christians are not immune to pain and problems when we surrender our life to Jesus Christ. In fact, it may be that when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the troubles will intensify. Think of the people in the Bible with me this morning. Think with me of the people in the Bible who suffered greatly after their salvation. 
James was beheaded by Herod. They arrested Peter intending to do the same thing. Eventually, Peter was crucified and by his own request, crucified upside down. That he would not be crucified exactly as his Lord. Stephen was stoned to death. John was boiled in oil and then exiled to Patmos. We know Paul was in and out of prison often for preaching Christ and eventually had his head cut off. Joseph in the Old Testament spent 13 years in prison under a false accusation. That was after being thrown in a pit by his brothers. Moses spent 40 years on the backside of a desert alone, isolated. <clears throat> Noah knew the scorn and rejection of his neighbors while he was preparing the ark. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for simply praying. Jeremiah was beaten and imprisoned and thrown into a hole for speaking God's truth. David was chased all over the mountains, really all over the, the side of, the, the, of Israel, What ch being chased by Saul. You know, quite a, quite a day when, when Samuel comes and anoints him with the oil and says, God's anointed, behold the Lord's anointed. Wow, that must have been quite a rush for David that day. But little did he know that that would only mean for him over a decade of agony and suffering. On that day that he was anointed, David was enrolled not just into the lineage of royalty, but in the school of suffering and brokenness. It's interesting that God has Peter pen the words that we read this morning in 1 Peter chapter 4. In fact, there's quite a bit about suffering in 1 Peter. <clears throat> I find that very interesting because <clears throat> when you look in the Gospel of Matthew, and I think it's also in a couple of the other Gospels, when Jesus pulled His disciples aside and told them, I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and the elders, and they're going to uh, eventually crucify Me, and then I'll rise again the third day, Peter took Him and began to rebuke him and saying that's not going to happen. And what couldn't compute in his mind, which is what can't compute in many Christians' minds is, how can suffering be God's plan? Most Christians today, their mantra is, doesn't God want me to be happy? God would never want me to suffer. And so he has Peter pen these words. And when Peter wrote the epistle, Nero was the king. Nero was notorious for taking Christians, soaking them in combustible liquid and using them to light his gardens at night. He would clothe Christians in the hides of wild animals and then set them out to be chased to death and eaten by dogs. We don't face that kind of suffering yet. But I know Christian people that have buried their babies. Christian people that have marriages that fail. Christian husbands that have stood beside their dying wives and wives, Christian wives who've had to plan the funeral of their husbands. Christians lose their jobs. Christians get their car repossessed or their home foreclosed. Christians get diagnosed with terminal diseases. Christians have rebellious children who get involved in sin and wickedness. Things that sometimes Christians lay awake at night thinking about, hopefully praying about. But it affects you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. 
Suffering is something that each and every one of us deal with every day of our lives. Suffering comes in big doses and small doses, but it comes to everyone. And we don't always know, and I, I know this, you, 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 will, you can know and you can find out why God is having you suffer. You will not know why God is having someone else suffer. Even though you think you do. What does it mean to suffer? Let me give you the definition of suffer. Suffer means to feel or bear what is painful, disagreeable, are distressing to the body or the mind. To bear or feel what is painful, disagreeable, or distressing to your body or your mind. To bear what is inconvenient. We suffer pain of the body. We suffer grief of the mind. We, we suffer the pangs of our conscience, maybe. We suffer the wrath of an almighty, holy God. We can suffer wrong. We can suffer abuse. We can suffer injustice. We can suffer with pain. We can suffer with sickness. We can suffer with sorrow. We can suffer with anxiety. We can suffer by evils of the past. We can suffer from fear and from disappointed hopes. Nobody, nobody likes to suffer. But usually when suffering comes to us, the normal thing and the, the response we see more and more is, why? Why, why am I suffering? And we, 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 we go to Romans 8.28 and say, well, all things will work together for good. Or we go over to Jeremiah, and it talks about the thoughts that God has for us. Is it, is it God's will that we suffer? Some would say, no, if you're suffering, it's got to be Satan. I would contend to you, look in your Scripture, if you would, if your Bible's still open at 1 Peter 4, would you look down at verse number 19? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to what, church? According to what? The will of God. Oh, it could be the will of God you suffer. Could it be the will of God for Paul to suffer and John to suffer and James to suffer and Peter to suffer and Stephen to suffer and Jesus to suffer? But if I suffer, hey, what's going on? What are you doing to me? I'm not supposed to have any pain. I'm not supposed to endure any discomfort. I'm not supposed to have anything... Bad happened to me. God, what did I do? And we, la we launch at God about what's going on. Peter writes about suffering. Suffering is something we seek to avoid. We see the suffering of men and women in the Bible. We see the suffering of Jesus Christ. Taking on flesh when He come to earth and suffering the pain and the agony and the death for us. But 21st century Christians, 21st century American Christians, don't think we ever ought to suffer. Or we think we're suffering if the air conditioner breaks. Most of you would say, if we come in this morning and we had benches set out instead of padded chairs, some of you would say, oh, what's going on here? I'm not sitting on that hard thing. Huh? Suffering for Jesus. Yeah, go to India. They'll sit on the ground to listen to preaching. Won't they, Brother Yoder? And think nothing of it. Why should I suffer financially? Why should I suffer without a mate? Why should I suffer physically? Why should I suffer in my marriage? Why should I suffer with addiction? Why should I suffer with a wayward child? Why should I suffer the death of my loved one? Why should I suffer with his old beat up car? Why should I suffer with my health? Should I never suffer in my life? Should I, should you or I, should we never suffer in our marriage? 
should we never suffer in our church? Should I never bear what is painful or disagreeable or distressing to my mind or my body? Consider Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. I know, these aren't the verses you're going to hear the health and wealth guys preach on. These aren't the sermons you're going to, you're going to turn the television on and hear guys talking about. 1 Thessalonians 3.4 Verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and ye know. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 1 Peter 4.15 Let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matters. By the way, just a side note, that's interesting, isn't it? Did you get murderer, thief, evildoer? And then he says a busybody is right up there with him. Wow. That's a pretty lofty company there. Verse 16, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. We feel like I should never have to bear in my body anything that's painful or dis disagreeable or distressing to me. If I do, I'm saying, come on God, What's going on? Come on, God, why are you doing this to me? And we get all upset. Now the world says, oh, you're in distress, oh, you're in pain, take this pill. We don't want you to be in any pain. Am I right? And we get the idea then, and I'm never supposed to be in any pain. Not just physically, but emotionally or, 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 or any other way. But God may want me to deal with some pain. God may want me to suffer for a while. There's a hymn in the songbook that says, More love to thee, O Christ. I think it's the third stanza of that song. Listen carefully. It says this, let sorrow do its work. Send grief and pain. Sweet are thy messengers. Sweet their refrain. When they can sing with me, more love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. Hear what he said? He said, I'm asking you to send grief and pain. Because they're your messengers that will cause me to have more love for you. And if that causes me to have more love for you, God, send your messengers. I'll take them. Hold your finger there in 1 Peter 4. Or put a marker there if you would. And look at Philippians chapter 3. Would you turn over there with me please? Philippians chapter 3. I know this isn't a hallelujah, praise the Lord kind of message. But it's one we need this morning. Philippians 3. Look with me at verse 10. Paul says, and you know the verse, most of you do, that I may know Him. Boy, that's a great, great desire, a great passion. Every believer ought to have a passion to know Him. That's Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I want to know Him. I want to know the power of His resurrection. How many times have you prayed for the power of God? God, I want Your power in my life. God, I want to know the power of the resurrection. And we want to know Him, and we want to have the power of the resurrection. But have you ever prayed for the next one? The fellowship of His sufferings. That's a mighty small fellowship. Lord, I want to know suffering like You suffered. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Back off there. I want to know the power and I want to know you. I don't want to go that suffering route. He 
It's a small fellowship of his sufferings. Look back at 1 Peter chapter 4. Look with me at verse number 12 where we started the passage reading this morning. Peter had to help these folks just like he has to help us. They've started going through some trials. They started suffering and they didn't like it. And notice what he said to them in verse 12. Beloved, think it not, what church? Strange concerning the fire trial, which is a trial as though some strange thing has happened unto you. You ever suffer and you think it's strange I have to go through this? Strange? It's, how come? Why, God? And we think that there's just wrong that we should ever have to suffer. Strange to us that we suffer while sometimes ungodly people seem to have it all. Strange to us that after a life lived for Christ or what we're trying to do for God, that our time would be rewarded with pain. We get difficult things and difficult days and enduring pain and, 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 and grief of mind. The things that can discourage us in our Christian life. Begin to wonder what's wrong with me? Or what's wrong with God? Or is he, has He abandoned me? I, I, I cry out to Him, I call out to Him and nothing happens. My situation doesn't change. I'm still suffering. Peter said, it's not strange that you suffer as a Christian. Stop thinking it's strange. It isn't. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. That's trouble. That's suffering. Suffer in my life, suffer in my mind, suffer in marriage, suffer in my job. Listen, let me help you with something. You ought to, you ought to say to you, remind yourself of something. I will suffer in this life. Now here's something else that might be just as painful. I will cause some suffering in this life. If you're honest this morning, and you're, and I think everybody in here is probably 12 or over, if you're 12 or over, you've caused somebody some suffering in their life. And you think you ought to never have to suffer? We think suffer, we think it's strange if we have to bear some pain and difficulty. Look at verse 13 in chapter 4 of 1 Peter. He said, don't think it's strange in verse 12 as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice. Wait a minute. Do I understand that right? So when I suffer, when I'm having distress of mind or body and emotional pain or whatever physical pain, I'm supposed to rejoice? That's what he said. That's exactly what he said. Rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Oh, I get to understand a little bit what it was like for Jesus to suffer when I suffer. That's a small fellowship, my friend. God always has a purpose. When we suffer and we think God's a million miles away, it's probably when He is the closest. He's working on us and molding us into what He wants us to be. Let me give you several reasons for suffering. Number one, suffering prepares us. Prepares us. God is, God is fixing in us a Christ-like character. Suffering's part of our sanctification process to make us more like Christ. And it's going to be part of our lives until we go to heaven. 
If you're not, you say, man, I don't know who he's preaching to. I don't have any suffering in my life. Well, God bless you. It's coming. I hate to rain on your parade. I don't want to. But it's reality. If your goal in life is, I want to get through this and never have any emotional pain or distress or grief, never any physical pain or stress or grief, my friend, you're going to be sorely disappointed. God's preparing us. He uses those things to prepare us to accomplish His purpose in our life. Most of us, listen, when things are going well and we don't have any suffering, you know, when, when everything's going smoothly, you know what we usually change? Nothing. Because everything's good. That's not what we make changes. The team, that, the team that wins and wins and wins and never loses a game, you know what they change? Nothing. You know, it wakes them up and says, maybe we better change some things. They lose a game. That hurts. And then they're ready to say, okay, I've got to make some changes here. And so God uses suffering for a purpose, and it's to prepare us. But He doesn't just prepare us, He proves us with suffering. He proves us. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 with me, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. Suffering prepares us. Suffering proves us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Peter writes, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He's testing the genuineness of our faith. And he said it's more precious than of gold that perishes. It could be found unto praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Christ. Remember at the judgment seat in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? How are we judged? Every man's work will be judged by fire. The fire is going to test it. If the matter is put to the fire, and if the, if the gold is put to the fire and it doesn't lose its nature, its weight, or its color, then it's the real deal. And my friend, when you're put to the fire of suffering and trials, and you keep the faith, and you rejoice, and you honor God, and you bring glory to Him, that's the real deal. That's the real deal. Genuine faith is proved by adversity. Genuine faith is proved through suffering. Job said, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And all this, Job never charged God foolishly. Suffering prepares us, it proves us, it purifies us. That's the refining process gold goes through. When you heat the gold in the fire, the impurities come to the top. God allows that suffering to come into our life so the impurities of our life come to the top and we can be and he can skim them off. The gold that has been purified is is more valuable and more pure than it was before it went into the fiery furnace. The fiery trials that it talks about, the suffering we go through is is designed to purify our life. To allow us to draw to a closer relationship with Christ than what we ever would had we never known suffering. The difficulty is, when we begin to suffer, all we do is we tend to focus on the suffering instead of focus on the Savior. And if you focus on the Savior, you can draw nigh to Him in your suffering. And then you welcome suffering because it draws you closer to Him. If all you do is think about the suffering, you get blinded by the circumstances and you won't see Christ at all. Suffering prepares us. Suffering proves us. Suffering purifies us. But suffering also protects us. What does suffering protect us from? Pride. Pride. Paul, 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. Well, in fact, turn there, would you please? 2 Corinthians 12. Are you okay? Are you all right? 2 Corinthians 12. Some of you are resting comfortably. Just go right on. The rest of us are having a good time. 2 Corinthians 12. You're familiar with the passage here. Paul said in verse 1, notice what he said, it's expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I'll come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And he talks about this vision he had caught up into the third heaven. And, and he said, I was uh, heard unspeakable words in verse 4 that it's not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Notice verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Why did Saul suffer? Why did God allow him to have that thorn in the flesh when he asked him three times to remove it? And God said, no, I'm not going to remove it because Paul said I would have been exalted above measure. I would have got too proud. You recognize that. That uh, what, what kept him from getting proud? God gave him some suffering. In fact, we told Ananias, remember he said, I will show Paul how great things he'll have to suffer for my name's sake. He caused a lot of suffering before he became a Christian. He's going to endure a lot of suffering after he becomes one. That's why Paul would know the fellowship of his sufferings. Suffering comes so we will not become confident in our own abilities. Suffering reminds us that God is in control and not us. And, and it's easy. It's easy to listen to this this morning. And agree with all of it until it happens to you. And that's okay. Listen, it's good. I was talking to somebody the other day. They said they were encouraging someone or talking to someone. And they said, really, I'm not sure I was talking to them or me. And you know what happens? You ever, you ever give somebody some counsel or be exhorting someone and give them some scripture? And at the same time, you know who you're talking to? Talking to yourself. Uh, you're, 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 you're trying to help them, but really you're trying to remind yourself of what you should do and the promises you should hold on to. You know why? You know why many times marriages end? Because people think they never should suffer in their marriage. I don't, it, there's times you're going to have to suffer in your marriage. You know why people jump churches and don't stay in the church? They don't think they ever ought to suffer in the church. Hmm? Suffering. There's reasons for it. There's purposes for it. The first, uh, so often, a response when we respond to our suffering, the first response is, God, stop it! Get me out of this! I don't like this! We use terms, I, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't like this. I don't feel good. This hurts. And we want God to remove it right away. Sometimes people run away from God. They get angry, resentful. They'll blame God for allowing that to happen. Others will remain steady and they'll be purified and proved. Peter said the proper reaction is to rejoice. Rejoice. The Spirit and the glory of God rested upon you. On their part He's evil spoken of, but on your part He's glorified. What did Paul say in in? 2 Corinthians 12. Are you still there? 2 Corinthians 12. When he, when he said, verse number 9, God said, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
So Paul responds, most gladly therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. You know, he's saying that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Man, I'll rejoice that I have an infirmity. I'll rejoice that I get to suffer for Jesus' sake. Because then the power of God will rest upon me. We can rejoice because God has a plan for us. God, she's saying this morning, God knows what He's doing. He's controlling this. Not me. Charles Spurgeon said, those who dive in the sea of affliction bring up rare pearls. Don't rebel. Rejoice. There was a man who tragically lost his young son whom he loved dearly. It's a very catastrophic experience for him and he never got over it. He began to ultimately lay the blame for his son's death at God's feet, severely affecting his relationship with God. How could God, how could a God of love take my son from me? That was his ever present cry. And the man never resolved his anger with God and never did he again serve or love the Lord the way he did prior to his son's death. But I got news for you. There's people in churches today who, are, who have blamed God for things in their life and are angry at God and are rebelling against Him. They put their Bible down. They don't pray. They, some don't even go to church. No longer under the preaching of the Word of God. And they, they, they miss messages like this that could help them get through their trial and get through their trouble. They can't lean on other believers who've been through some of the same waters and will help guide them through. People they can lean on and hear Scripture from that will shed light on their current troubles. You're in 2 Corinthians 12. Go to your left just a little bit to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, would you please? We get some... Help from the Apostle Paul here again in 2 Corinthians. Look at chapter 4, verse 17 with me, will you please? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. By the way, what's our, what's our life here on earth? It's but for a moment. <laughs> it's just a vapor. So he's saying our light affliction, which is only for this lifetime, worketh for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Don't, don't turn away from that suffering. Turn to it. Let God work that in you and through you. It's not a matter this morning of whether suffering will come. It'll come. The matter is, how are you going to respond to it? Are you going to rebel? Or are you going to rejoice? Are you going to let God prove you and purify you and protect you? The key is back in 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's go back there and we'll wrap it up this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4. Did you notice verse 19 again? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, what are they supposed to do? Commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing. When it says commit the keeping of their souls there, that's a, that's a, a banking term. It means to deposit for safekeeping. Means, listen, means no matter what comes into my life, whatever suffering God allows, listen, I'm not going to handle it myself. Oh, Pastor, God will never give anyone more than they can handle. That's not in the Bible. That's, that's something you have to come. That's one of those lies that you will talk about tonight that isn't the truth. God absolutely will give you more than you can handle, so you'll learn to let Him handle it. So you'll go to Him for help. So you rely upon Him. Stop trying to fix the problems yourself. Usually when that happens, we just create more problems. 
God will see us through the suffering. How long? Sometimes people say, I, and by the way, notice I commit the keeping of the will, uh, the keeping of my soul to Him in what? Well doing. Pastor, I'm just really going through it. I won't be at church tonight. Pastor, I'm just really, really having a hard time. I won't be able to be there this week. No, you commit to keeping your soul to Him in well doing. You keep doing what you know is right to do. I don't feel like going is not an excuse not to go to church. I don't feel like reading my Bible is not an excuse not to read your Bible. I don't feel like praying is no excuse not to pray. We commit the keeping of our soul to Him in well-doing. Well, Pastor, how long do I have to handle the suffering? How long do I have to stay in the suffering? As long as God wants you to. As long as God wants you to. As long as it takes. I'm told the refiner sits before the furnace. He fixes his eye on the metal. He makes sure that the fire is hot, but not but not, uh, not too hot, but hot enough to accomplish the purpose. He leaves that gold in the fire until the dross is completely consumed and removed. How does he know when the gold is ready to be removed from the fire? He says he can see his reflection on the surface. How long will you stay in the fire? Until Jesus sees his reflection on the surface until he sees his reflection in you and me then we're in the fire suffering boy that's we don't like to talk about it but I want to help you nobody don't don't you've heard me say it so many times you can you don't look at other people and think boy I wish I had their life man they don't have any problems <laughs> you have no idea Every one of you, if you came up here and we could see everybody, lay your problems on the altar. We, we could sit there and look at everybody's problems. You know what you do? You get up and come grab your own and say, I think I'll just keep what I got. I mean it. You, you look and say, they're dealing with that. They have that. Man, I've never known that. Boy, I'm glad I'm not them. We all suffer. There's a purpose for suffering. Don't complain. Don't rebel. Don't think that something's always wrong because I'm suffering. Now sometimes you can suffer as an evildoer like the Scripture said. If that's the case, you confess it and forsake your sin. But don't think that something's always wrong because you're suffering. No, God's proving you. He's purifying you. He's protecting you. He's trying to form Jesus in you. And He does that through suffering. Nobody suffered more than Jesus did. We'll talk about that on the Wednesday night. We have the Lord's table. We'll deal with just how much He suffered, not just on the cross, just coming to earth. And the suffering that He went through for you and me. So we might have eternal life. He suffered hell. He suffered hell so our suffering will be limited to this life. Once, once you take your last breath here, my friend, and you take your next breath in heaven, it's over. There's no more suffering. It's an eternal weight of glory, the Bible says. Okay? And that's because of what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. Thank him for that. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth here this morning. Lord, I don't know if I've gotten it across or not. I pray that you'll do what only you can do in our hearts today. I wanted to help folks as they go through this life and that we don't get unrealistic expectations that everything ought to be wonderful and everything ought to be great. And Lord, it is wonderful and it is great. It doesn't mean there's not suffering. It doesn't mean we all don't bear some pain and grief, distress in our mind and our body. But Lord, you have a purpose and you accomplish things in our life through that 
suffering and that pain. I pray that we would get to where the songwriter was when he said, Send grief and pain. Sweet are thy messengers. Sweet their refrain. When they'll cause us to say, More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment.